Hi, welcome to another video. This is 2017, so that means 120 years since William Crooks became Sir William Crooks, uh, knighted 120 years ago for the pioneering work he did in chemistry and as a physicist. As I say, English born, 1832 and died in 1919. I'll be looking at the William Crooks tube, which I have here on the table, and discussing uh, what he discovered. This, this wine glass, I've put a vacuum on it, uh, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, I'm going to reproduce his experiment and just pass a current through this wine bottle. This setup I've got today runs off 5 volts, roughly 5 volts, and it creates roughly 10,000 volts here. Uh, I say roughly, uh, the resistance of air, there's, there's a theoretical resistance, but you need 20,000 volts just over to give you conduction of electricity in air over one centimetre. So this is probably less than half a centimetre, which is the limit of this coil and this transistor. Transistor, diode, resistor, just oscillating uh, little step-up transformer to give us our spark here. So if I just turn it on momentarily, Now sometimes, this being a cheap coil from eBay, I think sometimes you get an arc in here instead of at these ends. There you go. So as I say, to get a jump through one centimeter, it's been established you need 20 and a half thousand volts. So this is maybe something like 10,000. And you can see there, I can actually smell the ozone uh, coming off this. So obviously today we, you know, modern electronics, we have no trouble producing a spark to jump across that gap. Do you think what the scientists had to do sort of over a hundred years ago? So Michael Faraday in the 1800s, born in Middlesex, incidentally, uh, born 1791 to 1867, discovered electromagnetic induction and electrolysis. Going on from Faraday, uh, this um, mathematician and physicist, uh, J.C. Maxwell, James Clark Maxwell, he's a Scottish scientist, put a mathematical formula together and said, this electromagnetic induction must be radiated in waves. So based on the mathematical formulas from Maxwell, Oliver Lodge, and uh, I, I believe he's a German scientist, uh, Heinrich Hertz, started trying to develop a practical scenario where they could demonstrate magnetic induction. Now, I haven't set up a coil and a transmitter and then a receiver, but they just simply demonstrated in a lecture hall, they'd turn on and off this spark with a small aerial and ring a bell a few feet away. Their practical experiment, all would do, send out a, a magnetic wave, some iron filings would probably contract, form a switch and set off an electric bell. That's how their experiment worked. So Heinrich Hertz was best remembered for electromagnetic radiation and as I say ringing this bell uh, yet Oliver Lodge had done the same amount of work in the UK. So Heinrich Hertz and Oliver Lodge didn't have the foresight to see oh we could use this for radio. And that's where that scheming bastard uh, Marconi comes along, takes all their ideas, all the years of research, puts it together, puts it in a box, and sort of sells it to the post office as a radio transmitter. Now he, he did go on to develop it and uh, you know, making better aerials. He still made money by patenting someone else's design, you know, put it in a box, and he says he says it was for the benefit of mankind, but it's the you know to, to line his robbing bastard pockets. Fortunately, Lodge, who'd already been doing this experiment and trying to get this bell to ring, uh, so Marconi developed his radio, but radio waves being sent out all over the world, Lodge developed an idea to tune radio frequencies to pick up just one radio frequency and not the rest. Uh, and to stop Marconi getting his hands on that, 
Oliver Lodge patented that idea. Uh, and what happens, I don't know, some, somewhere near the beginning of the 19th century, Mark Ernie comes along and buys the patent of Lodge. I think it was in the year 1900, Reginald Fassenden, he was a, an American, uh, made the first weak transmission of voice and music over the airwaves. Uh, his name got assigned to the first transmission, though co-developed by Adolf Slaby and George Von. Anyway, back to William Crookes, uh, English scientist knighted in 1897, so 120 years ago this year. What I'll do is set up his experiment, so we're going to pass the current through this wine bottle. So rather than have these two wires next to each other, I'll just simply crocodile clip on there. So as I say, this was developed by William Crookes. So there's my power supply. Got it set to five volts. I'm limiting the current to sort of 1.2, 1.3 amps when that transistor gets hot. Well, I can smell the ozone with this circuit switched on and it's a bit light in here, I'll put the curtains. Uh, I can just see a faint purple glow on this wire here. Now, unfortunately, the vacuum dies down every few minutes on this bottle, so I'll have to turn the vacuum pump on. Well, what I'll do, turn on the power. So you can see there is a partial vacuum, but not a full vacuum. Or not down to sort of near, you know, minus one bar. So you can see current is flowing through this vacuum but staying around the outside of the glass. So this purple light you can see are actually the uh, electrons hitting atoms. So that suggests there is still gas in there. Well, I'll turn this uh, air conditioning pump on, pull the vacuum down a bit more. <laughs> So on the gauges, that's down to sort of minus one bar. So, you know, in theory, that should be a total vacuum and nothing in it. But there has to be gas particles, otherwise you wouldn't get this light. Because, you know, electrons are invisible, you wouldn't see them. And down this end, you can see it actually sometimes they start to push away so this was uh, developed by yeah, Sir William Crookes back in the 1800s what a job they had to do so they had to create high voltage without any modern transistors power supplies, HT coils uh, and you know try and establish what our electron was doing when well, they couldn't see him they didn't even know what electricity was made up of you can see as the vacuum drops the gas particles being hit are around the outside of the bottle not in the middle as you can see two lines there obviously the electricity in me or the charge in me and the table obviously influencing this the other way the current flows through this vacuum. I'll turn this pump back on. So this isn't a cathode ray tube. This is the forerunner to the cathode ray tube because I've got no heated cathode in here. You would heat up a cathode, make it white hot, that would begin to emit electrons and you would attract them up the other end by putting a high voltage. And depending on the high voltage, if you made it like really high, like 100,000 volts, you can then you know, accelerate so many electrons, 
some of them come out of the tube and give you x-rays. Now x-rays, if you want to know where the name x-ray came from, is x. They didn't know what what rays were coming out of uh, the, the jar or the valve, so they called them x for unknown. Well, turn this vacuum pump on. Now before the vacuum drops, I can turn the voltage down a touch. That's turning it down. And you can see it becomes less concentrated. And turn the voltage back up. But I'm now losing my vacuum again. What I can also do is bring in this fluorescent light. If I stop it rolling on the table. So obviously some of the energy is flowing into this fluorescent tube and making the gas inside here fluoresce. As you can see this bulb isn't connected. But what I've noticed, if I turn this pump off, so obviously most of the current is flowing down to the other end and flowing back round in the circuit back to the coil. If we let that vacuum deplete, did you see this just come on? Let me uh, turn that pump back on. There was a noticeable brightness increase. Right, so it's nearly out. Right, just got to watch this tube get brighter. So as I say, this was a forerunner to the cathode ray tube. So in 1873, there was a, another English scientist, Frederick Guthrie, realised that when he put a hot metal plate grounded next to an electroscope, the hot metal plate discharged the electroscope, uh, but only when the electroscope was positively charged. If the electroscope was negatively charged, it didn't discharge it. So Frederick Guthrie, back in 1873, sort of discovered the hot tube or thermionic diode. In 1880, uh, over in New Jersey, you had uh, William J. Hammer, uh, assisted Thomas Edison in making the first light bulb but he discovered when making a light bulb you've got a blue glow around one electrode and a black around the other. They finally completed and patented the light bulb back in sort of 1883 something like that. So they created the bulb 1883, 20 years later so roughly 1904 uh, they created the thermionic diode uh, in, in the form of a vacuum tube which we all know and love today.
travellers with vacuum tubes, these audiophiles have done such a good yeah, marketing marketing job saying old oh, valves are better than transistors. The price has now shot up. Yeah, these should be know, a few pound at best. Now you can pay yeah, lots, lots for an average valve. So it's a shame back uh, yeah back in the day they didn't have fluke multimeters would have made their job so much easier. So this is a common mode choke, not too many windings on it. I've got that hooked up to my multimeter on millivolts. And if I zoom you in, you can see we've got 42 millivolts being induced into this coil. So there's a bit of history on William Brooks glass jar and passing an electric current. So yeah, this isn't a CRT cathode ray tube, it's just a wine bottle passing a current through a vacuum. And as I say, the, the illumination of the uh, atoms hitting the gas and lighting up, uh, as we would see as photons. So all brilliant, uh, you know, most, most of them, for the most part, all brilliant uh, English scientists from the likes of Faraday, uh, Oliver Lodge, J.C. Maxwell, who come up with the maths, he was the uh, Scottish scientist, uh, and then Frederick Guthrie, and then, you know, moving on to the valves, all that sort of stuff. So where would we be without them? Uh, I certainly wouldn't have, you know, today's mobile phones, would we? So quick history lesson, hope you liked it, thank you very much.